Good day everyone, welcome to my channel Lively Life Snippets. Wishing you living your life in the most lively way. Let's throw back to May 2019 when I had my last Diabetes Disease Medication Therapy Adherence Clinic DMTAC, presentation for my training. The title of my presentation is Choice of Anti-Diabetics Medications in Obese Patient with Underlying Heart Failure. The content was derived from one of the patient I had interviewed with my preceptor during my one-week DMTAC attachment. Please note that any content of this video does not substitute professional medical advices. If you have any health issues, please speak to your doctor and healthcare team. This video is a sample of few presentations that I had done during my provisionally registered pharmacist PRP training in Malaysia. What are the therapeutic goals of obese diabetic patients? The two main goals are to control blood sugar levels and body weight. Glycemic goals can be achieved through escalating insulin regime and combination therapy of injectable and oral agents while weight loss goals are more difficult to achieve and maintain over long term. During my attachment, I interviewed a patient Mr. Ul, who is a 35 years old Chinese male with my preceptor. He had no known drug and food allergies. It was the 5th DMTAC visit on the 9th of May 2019. Mr. Ul worked as operation manager at Bowling Center, he lived with wife and four children. He was an ex-smoker as he stopped for few months. He did not drink alcohol and live a sedentary lifestyle. His late mother had diabetes. He was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, hyperlipidemia, hypertension and heart failure with a left ventricular ejection fraction of 36% only in the year 2011. Mr. Ul is 170 centimeters tall. He put on 10 kilograms more weight from September 2018 to December 2018 after started on insulin for three months. He was classified to be in obese stage 2 with very high risk of comorbidities. Patients was being prescribed metformin and glycoside maximum dose and frequency in 2018. Then, Mr. Ull was started on subcutaneous insulatard injection 16 units at night. Other medicines for heart conditions were bisoprolol, perindoprol, spironolactone, frosamide and atorvastatin tablets. His insulatard was being switched to subcutaneous insigen 30 70ths in March 2019 and glycoside was being stopped simultaneously. Metformin was continued and other heart medications were continued to be collected from hospital. He claimed compliant to all medicines on all visits except on fourth visit on 19 April 18. He missed insigen 30 70ths evening doses three to four times per week. He showed satisfactory injection techniques on the 18th of December 28. His renal profile was normal. His Randrom blood sugar levels was within range in the year 2011 but on the high side in 2019. His HbA1c readings on September and November 2018 were 15.5% and 9.5% respectively. Both were higher than his target range of 7.1% to 8.0%. We aimed less tight target for this patient because he had heart failure even though he was quite young in his 30s. In terms of diet, on the first visit on the 18th of December 28, he claimed to have mihon soup or kui tiaf soup. He usually snacked between meals with kerapok or sunflower seeds. For lunch, he usually had mihun, kui tiaf or economic rice. For dinner, he sometimes drank apple juice only. All self-monitoring blood glucose SMBG, results were out of target range. He experienced nocturia once or twice every night, feeling lethargy and gained 10 kg weight within first three months of insulatard initiation, from September 2018 to December 2018. First visit had few issues. The first one is drastic weight increase since insulin initiation. As a result, subcutaneous insulatard was switched to subcutaneous levomere 20 units at night because insulin detemia has been shown to have a reduced weight gain effect compared with other insulins. Second issue was patient did not exercise, so we advised patient to exercise 5 times per week, 30 minutes each session. We also suggest to refer to occupational therapies for motivational weight loss. The third issue was patient diet was not balanced. We advise Mr. Ull to take 3 main meals per day and avoid snacking. Avoid sugary drinks and food. We also encourage patient to fruits post meal with a maximum of 2 servings per day. On the second visit, patient's SMBG results were all out of target range. Mr. Ull claimed did not experience hypoglycemic symptoms and no further weight gain. He exercised two to three times per week, 30 minutes each session. The frequency of nocturia reduced to approximately once per night. He started to have consistent diet but still imbalanced. In light of these findings, we suggest to increase the dose of Levomir to 24 units. 
If patient experienced hypoglycemic symptoms, he can reduce the dose to 22 units. Secondly, we encourage patient to exercise more frequently and aim for a weight loss of 10% per year. If the blood sugar's levels remain high on next visit, acabose or insigen R might be chosen to control postprandial blood sugar levels. Two weeks later, patient returned for third visit, his SMBG were lower compared to previous visit. He did not experience hypoglycemic symptoms and no further weight gain. He stopped exercise. The frequency of nocturia and diet pattern remained the same. Since the SMBG results were still high, patient was given an option to change insulin levomere to insigen 3070ths or self-purchase empagliflozin. Patient chose insigen 3070ths and was being started on 24 units before breakfast and 16 units before dinner. Patient was encouraged to take three main meals with consistent carbohydrate intake and not to skip meals. About three months later, patient came for fourth follow-up. Mr. Ull took about one to three servings of carbohydrates during three main meals. Patient some time drank Coke Zero. One of the three issues was patient did not perform SMBG because test strips ran out. We suggested to perform SMBG once daily, pre-meals with staggered timing. Target level is 4 to 6 millimole per litre. The second issue was compliance. He missed insigen 30 70 p.m. doses three to four times per week because he only remembered to inject halfway of eating and he skipped the dose. We suggested to set alarm as reminder to inject dinner dose. The last issue was about irregular carbohydrate intake. We emphasized on consistent carbohydrate intake in effort to bring blood sugar levels to optimum levels. We advise to continue current insulin regimen, S, C insigen 30 70 at a dose of 24 units pre-breakfast and 18 units before dinner which had been increased since the 19th of March 19. A month later, patient returned with high SMBG results. Besides, his weight increased 4 kg since last visit. Sometimes he was having nocturia. He claimed feeling stressed with work and excess sweating for past one month even in air-conditioned room. His diet became regular and he was newly cardiac specialist hospital. There are two main pharmaceutical issues identified from this case. First and foremost is high SMBG reading. Target fasting blood sugar is 4 to 6 millimole per liter while postprandial readings should be between 4.5 to 8.5 millimole per liter. All readings on the 9th of May 2019 were out of target range, indicating poor glucose control, probably temporarily due to stress. We set a more realistic pre-meals blood sugar target at the moment to be 9 to 10 millimole per litre. We also suggested to increase insigen 30 70 dose to 26 units morning and 20 units in the evening. It was about 0.4 units of insulin per kilogram. We also counsel on hypoglycemic symptoms and management and suggested to add on weight neutral vildagliptin tablets 50 milligrams OD. SMBG monitoring should be continued. Our interventions were accepted by Mo and patient showed understanding. Patient will come back on the 19th of May 30 to review blood glucose control. The second issue was high stress level. The rigors of managing diabetes can be stressful and lead to symptoms of depression. According to the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence NICE, people who are diagnosed with a chronic physical health problem such as diabetes, heart disease and cancer are three times more likely to be diagnosed with depression than people without these physical health problems. Diabetes can cause complications and health problems that may worsen symptoms of depression. Depression can lead to poor lifestyle decisions, such as unhealthy eating, less exercise, smoking and weight gain, all of which are risk factors for diabetes. Depression affects ability to perform tasks, communicate and think clearly. This can interfere with ability to successfully manage diabetes. Patient was referred for Depression Anxiety Stress Scales DAS, assessment. The result revealed moderate depression. Subsequently, patient was referred to medical officer for further management. Medical officer referred patient to occupational therapies for relaxation therapies. Why insulin increases weight? This is because insulin improves hyperglycemia and reduces glycosuria, rehydrates the body, increases fat-free mass by increasing total body water. Furthermore, insulin is an anabolic hormone and will enhance lipogenesis and inhibits lipolysis. Insulin is known to possess hypoglycemic properties. Insulin reduces blood glucose levels and this improves appetite in short term and greater food intake increases weight. Another possibility might be insulin causing frequent episodes of hypoglycemia and repeated treatment increase blood sugar levels and subsequently weight. 
Another case might be patients do not experience hypoglycemia but indulge in compensatory overeating due to excess fears of hypoglycemia. A part of insulins, three groups of drugs may be considered for add-ons to treat diabetes. They are dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitors DPP4I, sodium glucose COTRANSPORTER2 inhibitors SGLT2I, and glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonists glp one ra The first two are available in oral tablets while the last one is injectable. The examples of each group are as listed in the table. DPP4I is way neutral while SGLT2I and glp one ra reduces weight. SGLT2I confers cardiac benefits. All these three groups of drugs require renal adjustment in patients with kidney impairment. All of them reduces HbA1c levels by 0.2% to 1.5%. In term of clinic setting, DPP4I is quota item which requires family medicine specialist countersign. SGLT2I is a list A asterisk item and can only initiated by relevant specialist from hospital. glp one ra is not available from government setting. All of them had low hypoglycemia risk. In term of cost, vildagliptin is the lowest while glp one ra is the highest. The common side effects of each group are as shown. Patients on DPP4I should be advised on sign and symptoms of hepatic dysfunction while patients on SGLT2I should be informed of increased risk of genitalia and urinary tract infection due to glycosuria. Hygienic precautions are desirable. To avoid nausea, patients should be started on glp one ra with a low dose and then slowly titrate up. The clinical question that arises is can metformin be used by patients with heart failure? According to Micromedex 2019, heart failure is not an absolute contraindication. Tarani and the team classified acute congestive heart failure as use with precaution. Study by Misbin quoted that it had been recognized that the risk of lactic acidosis from metformin was no greater than the risk of hypoglycemia from sulfonylureas. As a result, metformin can be used. It must be discontinued if hypoxic state occurs. Clinicians should monitor creatinine clearance and estimated glomerular filtration rate. Stop metformin if the renal functions falls below 30 milliliters per minute or milliliter per minute per 1.73 meter square. Another clinical question worth considering is which one is better? Human insulin or insulin analog? Example of human insulin is Insigen 3070ths and it is usually dosed up to twice daily and patients have to use them 30 minutes pre-meals and the duration of action lasts for around 6 to 10 hours. Compared to insulin analog like Novomix 30, which can be given up to 3 times a day, just before meals and has shorter duration of action, only last for 3 to 5 hours. The latter allows more flexibility in dose adjustment corresponding to patient's meals intake. Other advantages of all analog basal bolus regimens include but not limited to significantly lower HbA1c than all human insulin basal bolus regimens, with lower risks of hypoglycemia, lower levels of postprandial glucose excursions, better patient adherence, greater quality of life and higher satisfaction with treatment. As a conclusion, while optimizing anti-diabetic medications to hit glycemic targets, weight loss targets need to be taken into account. Targets should be individualized depending on comorbidities. Combination of oral and injectable anti-diabetic medications should be individualized and fine-tuned to suit patients' needs. Following every dose increment as well as change of medications, glycemic control, SMBG, compliance, injection techniques, potential side effects, diet, physical activity and injection techniques, where applicable, should be monitored closely. Here are the references that I used. Feel free to check them out. Thank you for watching Lively Life Snippets. Comment below on what type of content you would like to see from my channel in future. If you like my videos, hit the like and share button. Don't forget to subscribe and see you all in the next episode.